welcome to Photography TV. Now, are you baffled by bargains or confused about choices when buying a camera? Well, in this show, we take a look at buying your first compact or bridge camera. Also, we take a look at the range of lenses on offer if you've bought yourself a DSLR and want to get more from it. Now, we're back at Photomart later talking with Heath Lassiter from Express Digital and fashion photographer John Gray, who gives us an expert's view on lighting. Plus, there's a look back at what's been in the news this month and, of course, we review more viewer photos in the critique section. But first, I'm here with Chris Mancy at Jessup's. Hi, Chris, you are right? I'm good. And how long have you worked here? Uh, going on three and a half years now. And do you enjoy it? Got the smile on my face. He has, yeah. And so, did you have a background in photography before working here? or? Uh, well, yeah, I uh, did a lot of work, both full-time and part-time, and now I'm actually an undergraduate at the local university. Oh, uh, fantastic. Doing my BA. So you're really into your cameras and you know your stuff? Uh, I'm into my cameras and I'd like to think I know my stuff. So why do you think people come, would rather come into a store to buy a camera rather than just buying online? Well, I think it's mainly due to that you know, one-to-one. -one. You, know, you get a chance to actually speak to people. It's kind of the whole emphasis of getting a good chance to have a trial before you buy. Yeah, and have a, you know, get someone to ask questions, I suppose, exactly. as well. And yeah. you're, I can see you're good at answering all the questions and showing people around. Well, that's the thing. You know, you've got any question you can throw at me, I'm sure I can find the answer. You know, it's you know, part of the and you see on a lot of like the internet forums and uh, questionnaires type of things where people say, you know, I've got X amount to spend, low budget, what can I do? So let's say if I've got £100, what kind of cameras could you offer? Well, I mean, there's a whole range. But I mean, four examples we've got here. Yep. These are prime examples because what they're bringing out is the key features. Okay. Ease of use. Yes. Simple design. Right. Compact design. Compact design is an essence nowadays. We've got a lot of people looking for small cameras they can take around with them don't want the clumsiness of uh, a large clum uh, clunky camera, but yeah. they still want to get the quality back. Okay. The best camera is, for example, this little Fuji here. Yeah. 100, like a little hundred pounds, bright blue, something a bit more interesting, easy to use. Best thing about this is the ease of use. You don't okay. have to stop and think. Same okay. applies to this. These two here, however, brought these two a little bit more. Okay. These ones here, 130 and 140. Right. However, what you're getting here is a little bit, a little touch of something further up the range. Both the Panasonic and the Sony take features from their bigger brothers, which usually sit around the 250 to 300 pound mark. Okay. However, with these ones here at just shy of 150, you are picking up a lot of those features. So basically, for an extra 50 quid, it's almost worth going that step further, is it? I think. You think? I think every £50 is worth it, um, yeah. because what you've got there is featured, like I said, mainly in the lens, yes. the lens being one of the key areas of the camera, and that's what you're paying for. Um, you have to obviously play the risk of uh, uh, playing the game of, do you go with a brand, yeah. or do you go with uh, advice? Okay. And that, that's where I step in. Fantastic. And also, obviously, with these designs, do you think fashion is having an influence on the cameras? Do you think they're getting a bit more quirky? And uh, definitely so. Yeah. Uh, we're sef definitely starting to see it. I mean, you can start straight away with the nice uh, electric blue there. Yeah. Uh, very much so as well uh, with people like Sony starting to bring out the T-Series models with the touchscreen panels. Oh, wow, yeah. Very much like, like a Sony iPhone or something. Um, Apple iPhone, yeah. uh, so you've got the idea of touchscreen panels, easy to use, again, it's the whole uh, credibility of design. Absolutely. Right, also, I mean, when I'm out, on a night out, I just get my camera phone out, take my pictures, so would I be just wasting my money on buying a compact camera and having a phone? What's the difference? Well, I mean, definitely not a waste of money in a sense. Now, uh, camera phones, yes, they are starting to hold integrity. Yes, you know, you've got very uh, high quality ones by comparison to what we had a few years ago. Yeah. However, in, as far as the standards in, in, in ranging environments, you mentioned going out at night, yeah. Nikon here, Nikon here have pride themselves, and very right, and rightly so, on being able to expose very well in low lights, okay. picking up the details, you see, and that's what it's all about, the details, because that's what comes out when you print your photographs. Absolutely. Um, something your, digital, your compact camera phone will still struggle with. So do you think overall, even if you've got sort of an 8 megapixel camera on your phone, do you think it's still worth going for a separate? Yeah, definitely so. Again, for the same reason, it's in the details. Megapixels are just one element of yeah. the game. They are just a, a, a guideline, if you like. There are many things under the skin, which the, uh, the manufacturers even won't tell you about. Right. Again, this is a thing you have to try before you buy. Yeah. There are certain features that even the highest megapixel camera on the market may still fall off with. And these four examples, however, I feel, cover nearly all the important, most of all the important factors yeah. you can get for around the 150 mark max. 
Thanks very much, Chris. We'll be back with Chris later on. But now we're heading back to Photomart with Heath Lassiter, who explained the merits of location workflow and the benefits of Express Digital. Hi, Heath. You all right? Hello. Doing good. Good. Awake? Oh, awake? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Got your coffee. Working on it. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so tell me a bit about Express Digital. Sure. Express Digital started about 14 years ago. Our CEO and founder, Graham McFarlane, actually started the company with his brother. His brother is the CTO of the company and started actually doing all the programming for the software. More specifically, about the workflow software Darkroom. Sure. It has the ability to capture the image, so you can actually shoot tethered or you can shoot wirelessly. It has the ability to manage the software from the perspective as far as printing, creating your own packages. It also has the ability to enhance the images. So you can go in there and do green screen technology, high key. You can also create your own backgrounds, borders, um, just as creative as you want. So you could go and take a picture of Buckingham Palace and actually utilize that as your background. So who is this aimed at? It's aimed at the professional photographer. We also work with amateur photographers, professional photographers, and school photographers as well. So we're really trying to target everybody. Yeah, and is there any other competitors in the market? There are other competitors with a couple of different softwares. For example, our Darkroom Core Edition has a lot of competitors, and our Darkroom Assembly, which is for schools, has a lot of competitors. But our Darkroom Professional, we pretty much own the market in the US, and we hope to take it over here in the UK as well. So is it available in the UK at the moment? Yes, or? it is. It's actually available in the UK currently. It's been available in the UK since March of 2007. We've been growing rapidly here in the UK and in Ireland and um, we really hope to dominate the European market here. And do you feel it's going well so far? It's, it's going great thus far, especially with the help of Photomart. Fantastic. Well, it's great meeting you and talking to you. Thank I'm you sure very I'll much. I'll see you later on in the right. day. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another exhibitor at Photomart was Bertus Foss from Fujifilm, who was demonstrating Fuji's widescreen print solution along with workflow solutions. The basic idea about the seminar today is to give photographers a better understanding of color management and how that impact on their workflow, especially when it uh, comes to wide format inkjet printing. Combined with that, we have just launched a new software RIP, so I'll be explaining the RIP to them and the benefits and features that we have put into the RIP specifically for the photographic industry. Whereas in the past, RIPs have been intended for repro house use, this has been done especially with the, the photographer in mind. And then we'll go over into the inkjet itself um, and the different options that's available on the market, different products, and which are the best ones for their particular use. Okay, well that's just about it for part one. But Chris, my director just told me I can spend around £300 on a bridge camera. So what do you think you can do for me there? I'll see you in part two. Okay, so in part one, I asked Chris what I could get for £300 mark for a bridge camera. So you've managed to narrow it down to these three. So tell me a bit about why you've picked these. Yeah, I mean, first of all, with your bridge camera, the benefits you get all lie down in, uh, in factors such as your lens, your manual control, and your ease of use, again, and then back to the fact of now having the speed, because that's okay. another factor that gets improved with your bridge camera. First one I went to um, was a bit of a, an unknown uh, in, some people's in some people's minds, however, a really strong contender. Fuji uh, 8100 FD. This model here, wonderful choice. Very fast camera, uses a sensor system very, uh, very uh, unique to Fuji and Fuji alone. It's a, it's, it's a super CCD sensor. The benefits of that, wonderful gradients, incredibly quick. You see here straight away the ergonomics and design of the camera. Very simple, very easy laid out. Control switches, easy to access. And like any good camera, you've got the comfy grip on it. And that's again, really important. The second choice actually um, was the Panasonic. The Panasonic uh, coming in about the same price. What, two, what were those two? 249. 249, okay. 249. So what we've got here, very similar again. A generic uh, standing as far as the ergonomics and the layout of the camera is concerned. This, I must say, is um, a bit of a soft spot on myself because okay. what you've got with this, you've got a Leica design lens. Now, Leica um, produce a very high standard, but Leica now designed for Panasonic. What you've also got in this is an SLR standard processor. Again, very important. You've got speed of response, and this is what you're paying for when you go um, to a presumer or a bridge camera. You're paying for the speed and you're paying for the control, and in relation to that, you're also then getting a better lens. This one, for example, has an 18 times optical with an image stabilizer. And it's a true stabilizer as opposed to a synthetic anti-shake. This, however, Nikon P80, a little bit more, 50 pound more, it's 299 for this, so it's still within your budget. Yep. This one here, 
lovely camera. Yes. Feels much more like an SLR as far as the standing is concerned. Unlike um, what you find here as well, you, you can, they have still managed to get it down to a relatively small body. Yeah. Uh, and this is again due to experience. But I think quite a nice blend between the two. Speed, control, view, nice easy to use viewfinder. It's a, a combined package. Again, giving a times, times 18 optical zoom not digital. Why is it better to be optical? Well, we're not optical. Basically, uh, the benefits are in the world. You are using the lenses to magnify. If you're a digital zooming, which a lot of uh, compact cameras have, all you're doing is simply enlarging the digital file. It's, yeah. uh, you're not actually bringing anything into a closer shot. You are just simply expanding information you had before. Not a good thing. No. Um, so yeah, like I said, three really strong models, all fall below the 300 pound bracket. A lot of people will go with the Nikon, yeah. uh, but I will say the new Panasonic there is definitely punching its weight at the moment um, and within a very, very realistic price bracket as well. But to kind of sum it up then really, I mean compared to a compact camera you're gaining more control. Well basically you're controlling everything. Yeah. With this, just like you did with your film cameras now, you've actually got control of your aperture, yep. your shutter speed, everything. <clears throat> what you've also now got control of, uh, into a degree with these, you've actually got control of the focusing. Right, okay, the yeah. point of focus, the depth of field. These are all things that a lot of people who trained on film cameras or used to use a film SLR but now want to get into digital will be familiar with but won't necessarily want, um, have access to on the compact cameras. And this is where presumer or bridge cameras come into their own because now you're not being restricted by design, style or size. You're being restricted, you're, uh, you're effectively speaking actually, you can say there is no restrictions at all. No. Okay. They can put whatever they like on this camera and that suits a lot of people. But I will say to everybody straight away, first yeah. thing you need to do on this camera is try before you buy. Yeah. Give them a squeeze like you're buying your melons because basically <laughs> you don't give them a squeeze, you will not, I will say straight away, I don't find that a comfortable camera to hold. Okay. But however, you may find it, with the size of your hand, much more comfortable to hold. It is a preference thing in a lot yeah. of cases, and that's very important to give it a try. Thank you very much for that, Chris. That was fantastic. And now we're going to take a look at what's going on in the past month's news. Welcome again to Photography TV's news update. During July, Nikon UK announced the introduction of an all-new FX format digital SLR, full frame as opposed to the DX, which is a smaller sensor. The 12.1 megapixel Nikon D700, designed to allow more photographers to enjoy the acclaimed image quality of the Nikon D3 with its smaller, more portable body. The D700 inherits the superior image quality of the D3 and uses the same core technologies such as the highly sensitive 12.1 megapixel CMOS image sensor. £1,000 cash prize up for grabs. Sound good? Well, the University of Aberdeen launched Picturing the Past, a new photography competition aimed at professionals and amateur photographers of all ages has been launched today. The competition challenges entrants to capture striking images of archaeological sites in the northeast of Scotland. Devised by archaeologists at the University of Aberdeen and funded by a cultural engagement grant from the university. From ancient stone circles to impressive hill forts, entrants are being asked to take inspiration from the wealth of monuments located within the Aberdeenshire area. It's hoped the competition will encourage members of the public to discover and explore the variety of archaeological monuments in the region. The closing dates for entries to the Picturing the Past Photography competition is the 30th of September 2008. Instant photography is going digital, with the release of a new instant photo product from Polaroid. Polaroid, who brought you instant photography 60 years ago, has launched the Pogo Instant Mobile Printer, an inkless printing process that can instantly print photographs off your mobile phones or cameras. The printer, which is roughly the size of a deck of cards, used Bluetooth or USB connectivity to receive pictures and create instant, full-colour digital photographs without the use of ribbons or ink. Now, here's the clever bit. Images that were once stuck on your mobile phone can now be printed into borderless 3 by 2 inch photographs in less than 60 seconds. The printer, which weighs only 8 ounces, uses zinc photo paper, a durable material that contains colourless cyan, yellow and magenta dye crystals which are activated through heat pulses. The paper is manufactured by Zinc Imaging and retails for between 20 to 30 pence per print. So that's not bad. The Polaroid Pogo is available now and is priced at £99. Ultimate Nature Gear has developed a new hide for wildlife photographers. The Camo Tree Gilly 360 Wildlife Photography Hide has been designed by photographers for photographers and is made using their own camouflage pattern. 
The hydra was released at the end of July, priced at around $149.99, including VAT. More accessories will follow in the same pattern, including clothing and camera bags and backpacks. The memory card market is on the up, as more and more people need space to store documents, photographs and music. With people needing to store more information, it isn't surprising that the memory card market has seen good growth this year. According to GFK Retail and Technology, sales in May were up by 31% compared with the same period last year. Sales in May alone reached nearly 1 million, with most of the growth coming from standard memory cards you find in cameras. Well, that's all the news for this month. We'll see you next time. A growth area for photography over the past few years has been the explosion of sites such as eBay, with sellers showing photos of their items for sale. For our critique slot this time, we thought we'd take a detailed look at some product shots and offer some pointers on what to do and what not to do. Now, professional photographer Dave Marriott is our critique this time. Now, Dave started his photography career back in 1972, first working for newspapers before going freelance in 1991. His projects have been varied, from the London Eye to Ferrari, where he's jetting off to later. So, OK, Dave, let's have a look at the first image. Now, we've got a sort of eBay-style image that you might find if you were searching through. <laughs> yes. So, what's your opinion on this picture? Well, first of all, you've got to look at this picture and say, what are we trying to sell? Um, the image is there, but you can't really see it. It's on a very busy background, yeah. which isn't what you want. The important thing with an eBay image is to see it not everything around it so that is a waste of time you wouldn't know what that was so we get rid of that one okay so we've got a slightly better one here yeah this one's a lot cleaner the uh the photographer's actually taken it a little bit more thought but unfortunately we've got such a dark shadow on this long black lens right. you can't even see what that is either better clean background that's important see the camera body a bit better but the lens i'm afraid is wasted. so how have they improved it then on this picture this one here is obviously your, she has used some extra lighting. So we can see that there is a lens. We've got highlight on the lens here. We can see it. We can see the lens. We can see the focusing barrel, everything else. The apertures, which are important to some people, if they want to know what it is, and how it's fixed to the body. And there's no nasty shadows. No. So, you know, that would look better out of the three. If you yes. saw that or that, you say, oh, this one looks quite nice. Someone's taken care of it. Absolutely. We'll go for that. No. But the big problem with this, what are they trying to sell? Exactly, I was going to say. Yeah, with eBay, you've got to be careful. People want to see what's for sale. And in this yep. case, it was actually the camera, not the lens. Oh, really? So <laughs> there's the camera. <laughs> well, there's the camera, yeah, without the lens. So obviously, all those three we've looked at, we discard. Yes. That's a waste of time. These ones, this is better, nice and clean. It's cut the edges off. We want to keep it a bit, you know, leave a little bit of space around it so we yep. can see it. Important, it's nice and sharp. You can see all the detail, how well it's looked after. It's nice and clean. No nasty dents and bangs and things. Yeah, much better. And then we've just got some more views of it, which I think is important as well. Yeah, overall view, front. We've got the top, we've got the front. Once again, you can see a nice uh, lens mount here, no damage. That's important. Somebody's going to buy a camera like this. This is obviously an old camera. Film camera, in fact, not even digital. Oh. So <laughs> can we still buy that stuff? Yeah. Um, on eBay, you can. No. This is important when people are buying this sort of camera. They want to know that it's been looked after. Definitely. You know, they're going to they can't go into a shop in eBay and pick it up and look at it. No. They've got to see it from your picture. So the pictures do really tell the story. Absolutely. And if this had all big knocks down here and across the top, it's oh, no not going to be bothered. But that looks a nice... Uh, yeah, and again, that's just from the back. And yeah, once again, nice. There's no scuffs across here where you've had it bashed against another camera over your shoulder and all that. That's fine. I, that's very nice, yeah. So overall, what are the top tips then for getting it right? Top tips, um, probably most important is your background. Yeah. Which sounds really crazy, doesn't it? You know, you're not selling a background. But if the background's clean and tidy, the image you've got on there will stand out from it. Definitely. So once we've got that, that's fine. Depending on what colour it is, it's no good putting a black camera body on a black background. No. So, you know, I know that sounds common sense, but a lot of people don't think of that. Oh, put it on there, bang, that's it. So. Black camera body, bit of silver, less of a nice white or bright background for it. Next of all, get some lighting in there. Yeah. If we've got cameras with flash guns on them, bounce it off the ceiling, which softens the light down for you. If you've got some old white card, drape it over something, you know, put a box on a table, put some card on there, put some white card in at the sides. All that helps put light back in and prevents all these nasty shadows and gives a nice soft image, which is much better to, to see. 
So there we go. I mean, it's important also that you do show detail. Mm, so yeah. the one here where we said about the, that one's nice, but this one here with the top, yeah. show this detail and show that it isn't damaged. Definitely. You know, you, you want good money for this camera. Um, show it's not damaged. I think the main point is take your time, um, make sure you've got everything in there, but maybe clean the camera up a bit, get a decent photo, clear the surface, and yeah. you're going to get more people looking at it. Of course you are. I, you know, I mean, if a photographer is going to buy a camera, he wants to buy a good one. Absolutely. And he will know what he's looking at. But that's on anything. It doesn't matter. You know, you could be selling these cups on eBay. Yeah. You know, you yeah. could have a set of cups. This is a very nice cup, isn't it? We could have this in the, and yours there. Nice close up. Yeah. Make sure we can see the handle. You know, don't just stand there, oh, click, bang, that's it. Think about it. Come in nice and low, have the white background up here or a nicer colour background. Show the handle. Do one from the top, show the size of the top, show the, the, the actual image. So when you look at it on there, you say, oh, they're nice mugs. We'll, yeah. we'll have them rather than just an out of focus. Rubbish, rubbish picture, picture that yeah. everyone will ignore. Sit on the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. some wise words there from Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now in part three, Chris is going to take us through the purchase of lenses and John Gray talks about lighting. Welcome back to part three. Our final trip to Photomart is to a seminar run by John Gray, who's demonstrating the effects of lighting whilst photographing a model. Okay, so John, what will you be covering today in the workshops? Well, today we're going to be demonstrating uh, portraits and uh, how to work with the model, as well as the latest ring flash from Bones. Um, and basically, we're going to give the, the uh, photographers a chance to work on a one-on-one -on -one with the model. Now, as you mentioned earlier, you use predominantly Bowens lighting. So why have you chosen that brand? Well, Bowens I've been working with for some years. And the two things I like about them is, first of all, they're reliable. Uh, and I put them through a lot of work. So they're, they're always working in the studio, uh, you know, for many hours. Plus they have a very good uh, repair service and they, you know, look after their customers. Now I can also see you set up, you've got some new soft boxes. So how do these compare to maybe the older models? Well, the, the new soft boxes are designed more for digital photography because uh, digital photography is uh, a much flatter image and the new soft boxes are actually got more contrast in them. Uh, they're very good for, you know, digital cameras and that's primarily what they're designed for. Now you'll also be using a ring flash today which is used predominantly with fashion and beauty photography. So why is that? Well, the new ring flash which is a much better design than the old one, uh, it's got a, a, a higher power, power packs that you buy with it. Uh, it's very good for high fashion. Also a lot of young photographers now are using it for portraits yeah. to get a much more sort of a trendy uh, image, a much more powerful image. And you'll also be using a model here today. Well, I'm going to be demonstrating a beauty lighting setup and show these guys how you can do a simple uh, lighting setup with just using these, these two uh, attachments. And uh, we're going to give the guys a one-to-one -one chance to work with the model, plus I'm going to be showing the new ring flash, which a lot of uh, photographers haven't seen lately, and uh, you know, hopefully they're going to enjoy it and uh, have a good time. And have you got any top tips maybe for aspiring and professional photographers? Yes, I'd say most important is to design a good website so that their images can be seen, they have different styles of images, different uh, sort of contrasting images, plus obviously they have to promote themselves through the website, so change the website on a regular basis and basically uh, give good quality work as well as creative work. Great, well, thank you very much John, I'll see you later on, cheers. Well, I hope you've enjoyed those trips to Photomart as much as I have, but moving on, we're back with Chris. I'm going to take a look at the type of lenses you can buy if you bought yourself a DSLR camera. So what kind of stuff have we got here then? Well, starting yourself off, when you buy your SLR, you're going to get your kit lens. That sounds a bit like I'm going to have to build it, I'm not very good at that kind of thing. No, no not no? quite. What your kit lens is going to do, your kit lens is going to get your standard lens. Oh, okay. Standard usually referring to 50mm, that's where we tend to start the ratio off. Saying that though, the word standard can often be pushed to one side now. Yeah. There's nothing standard about these lenses. Good example, Canon here, new 40D, came out about the end of last year. What this has got, this has got a 17 to 85mm image stabilised USM lens. Okay. 
Major benefits there, image stabiliser, multi-coated glass and ultrasonic motors. This lens is worth about £500 by itself. Buy it with the camera as the kit, you get it for £200. So that's again the sort of thing you're looking at. Right. Sony doing very much the same thing, offering you a nice 18 to 70 mil lens, designed by Carl Zeiss Group, simply because it doesn't carry the badge. Again, they knock it in half. The prices in these things are fantastic. And because of that, you get a good kit to start you off. Okay, so moving on from kit lenses, what, what other lenses can you buy? Well, the main choices that are starting to open up now are, are quite vast, but the, the, good, the biggest trend is the all-day lens. Right, okay, and what's that? <laughs> well, all-day lenses, very simple. They're going to cover you the whole way through. You can use it for everything. And by that, I mean 18, so as in general wide angle, right the way through, through your 50, up into your telephoto. And by that, I mean anything like 200, um, uh, 200 mil, approximately 30, sorry, 20 uh, times optical zoom yeah. in some respects. So you get a really good range of everything within one lens. Um, there are pluses and there are negatives to this. I mean, okay. the plus is you get one lens to carry on board your camera. No more changing of lenses, no more swapping stuff over. The uh, only negative is it's got a lot of work to do. It's got a vast, it's not as dedicated. Okay. This can be questioned for the quality. A great example though, from a third party manufacturer is the Sigma here. It's a DC 18 to 200 mil. It's optical stabilized. Optical stabilizer, basically their word for image stabilizer, or as Nikon would call it, vibration reduction. This is a lovely feature to have on a lens that can cover such a vast range. Again, cancelling out your blur. Yep. Everyone else is offering at least one at the moment. One I thought was worth bringing to the table is Sony's version. Okay. Again, similar sort of range as this. Doesn't need to carry a stabiliser, however. The, on the stabiliser, with the Sony, it's all in the camera. Right, okay. That's one thing to look out for if you're looking at actually buying a Sony. Don't be put off if it hasn't got a stabiliser on, on the batch. It's all in the camera. Okay, so what about any specialist lenses? Well, a specialist, as the word would suggest, is quite an open, uh, open dream. Where you've got there, you've got your, mainly your wide-angle lenses yeah. and your macro lenses. This is where you start to get into areas such as your landscape photographer, your detailed internal uh, close-up photography. We won't go into that too much because it really is, like I say, a really long dream. You can yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And you've got some telephoto lenses here as well. Yeah, right? I mean, with a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, with your all-day lens, it gives you a bit of everything. However, yes, nowadays, if, I mean, if you aren't so tied down to that idea of only having to carry one lens, for many people, it's still a better option to carry the two. What we tend to find is um, when you make the purchase of your standard camera, your lens, it will finish you off in the, 70, the 50s or the 70s. So you want to be finished starting off from about that point onwards. Yep. You don't have to feel that you're tied into buying the manufacturer of the camera with your lens either. Good examples come from people, like I said earlier, with Sigma. For example, this one here, this is made by Sigma. It's APO, which means they uh, double coated the, gl the glass and the lens, so they've got wonderful build quality. It's well made, it's light, and in, in, with all that, you've still got yourself 300 mil optical range. Right. With that, you've actually got a bigger range than any of the all-day lenses we mentioned earlier. Sony also bring into the plate a nice offer here. Again, what they've done with theirs is start it at 75. Okay. That way, finishing off exactly where you left off with your standard lens and giving you a little bit of cross. I will say I brought this one to the table, a little bit more chunky. Not, the, not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, no. but the, the reason I brought it forward is because we spoke of the 40D earlier. Yeah. The 40D standard lens is way and above the, the means of standard. And what this is, this is basically the big daddy to the standard lens that comes with the 40D. It's EFS, it's image stabilised, and it's got a USM motor. Everything about this lens mates perfectly with that camera. Image stabiliser, like I say, hugely beneficial when you've got any form of optical range. You're trying to stabilise what's going on there. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This is doing it physically within the lens. What sort of price range is this one? Well, what we're looking at here is about £380. So like I say, all of that isn't uh, necessarily peanuts, so it is, you know, it's by no means as far as you can go. No. Strictly speaking, the, the sky's the limit with lenses. Uh, in actual fact, Canon have a £75,000 lens on the market currently. Oh, <laughs> but um, within the general range, most um, people will tend to look for when they're going up the range, isn't necessarily how expensive it is, it's what it can do. And by yes. that we mean, for example, the speed, for example, tends to increase. 
being able to carry a lower rest stop, letting more light in, working better at high speed. This is the sort of thing you start to see when using sports photography or wildlife photography, and that's what tends to drum in the extra pounds, anything up to around about 1,300 pounds right. average figure. That's what we're looking at for a telephoto nowadays. Right, well, so that's true. fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris, for everything you've done with us today. And a big thank you to Jessops for allowing us to be here today. We'll see you next time.